Welcome to the Page One Podcast, a podcast featuring a variety of guests and thought leaders on topics ranging from digital marketing, sales channel strategies, influencer marketing, best in class product launches, and all the details about how to accelerate sales. Now, here's your host, Luke Peters. Thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Peters, CEO of Newer Appliances and Retail Band Digital Strategy Agency. In this episode, you're going to learn from Chris Giles, who has done it all on how to start, scale, and sell your business. Chris grew up as a leader in an entrepreneurial environment. He used the skills to build multiple companies and all the while maintaining a social conscience to help others. Chris has built multiple companies from the couch and then sold them, allowing him to retire. He currently helps companies be more successful, working with them directly to build their world. He does all this while growing a wonderful family and lots of friends. Carpe Diem is the philosophy he lives by. Chris, thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. Wow, that is a wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Luke. It's nice to be on. It's nice to be talking to everybody out there. And I hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day today once we get around to talking to you. So let's go. Awesome. And, and Chris, um, we're going to talk about a lot of the things you're doing with your new business where you're helping other companies. But why don't we back up a little bit? I want to learn a little bit about um, the businesses you have started and sold. Um, you know, and they're in the logistics space. Um, would you mind kind of giving the audience a quick breakdown of those companies so they, they know your background? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I grew up in an entrepreneurial environment. Uh, as you mentioned, my father was an entrepreneur, so I was always surrounded by it. I, I had my own entrepreneurial experience during uh, university, like most of us tried. I had a fencing and deck business that went on for the three years, and it was fantastic and really enjoyed it. So after re- university, I realized and always knew beforehand that I was going to be an entrepreneur, but I went and found out what industry it was going to be in. I fell into logistics and really enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Uh, worked for a number of uh, larger organizations, Yellow Freight and, and uh, Direct Transit, some other organizations. Learned a lot. And then uh, I realized this is where I was going to play, play my uh, cards for being an entrepreneur. And I started my first business, Connect Logistics, in 1999 with a partner. And uh, we, it, you know, I think we'll get into a little bit more about how, how and why I started it. But it was the idea of I really felt there was an opportunity where communication uh, had faltered in that industry. I think communication is really what logistics is. And people think it's the movement of the product. It's the understanding of the movement of the product that's critical. And so I built that company fairly successfully. And then uh, as we went and grew that company, we discovered that my partner had a terminally ill uh, uh, daughter uh, and uh, some other things that were going on. So I wanted to grow exponentially in the business. And he would like to have had it uh, uh, kept it the same. So we created a great buy-sell agreement where he kept the business. And I went on to build another company uh, dynamic connections, and it worked out famously where he was able to have a successful career, and that business went on to become very successful. And uh, dynamic connections was grown uh, uh, with an office here in Toronto and an office in California, all built on technology to try and take the customers, uh, the shipments that they did, and provide communication and a complete understanding as to where the product was and what was happening, not only with the product but also with their customer. And so used a lot of technology to try and build a better interface uh, and uh, grew it uh, exponentially and then sold it in 2016 uh, to a gentleman who still owns it and it's going on to great success. That's an overview. I mean, you, I didn't want to take up too much of your time, but any questions I guess maybe. Yeah. Ask. Well, so with dynamic, um, give us a, an idea for like how big you scaled the business, either revenue, number of employees, just sure. so the audience has an idea there. Yeah. So we were growing exponentially at the time we were, um, at the time I sold it, 2016, which of course is the best time to sell. And it was related to uh, growth in California, actually. So we had started with an office here in Toronto, just myself and three people to start us off. And because I started the business before and, and done a logistics company, we went after it really hard and exponentially grew the number of employees as well as the revenue we had on an annual basis by a considerable percentage in the first three to five years and kept growing up to, we're about 30 employees and we're above $35 million in revenue uh, when we sold it. Um, sorry, $25 million in revenue when we sold it. And then the expectations were we would have been probably around 30 to 35 by the time we hit uh, 2020 with the growth we were seeing in the United States with our uh, new office in Long Beach. Along the way, what the best thing I really enjoyed about it, I think, is being able to start a business like Dynamic Connections, having the opportunity to almost restart your career, which is what I did after Connect Logistics. I really did it 
with all the right things in place. I built the plan before I even started. And even the sell of the business uh, came down to uh, uh, knowing exactly what I was going to sell it for, how I was going to sell it, and who most likely would buy it, why they would buy it. So because we started the business with that plan already in place, it was a really fun journey. It took us eight years to do so. And uh, our profits were extraordinary. Our people were extraordinary. And the plan is still working today where the company is extremely successful. What a great story. And why did you sell, Chris? Was there a particular reason? It was always planned to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I figured out when I, when I built the first business and, and we decided to sell it that um, I wanted to, uh, um, I realized that was the best way to go about it. Not, not many people could build a business from scratch. And if you could build a business from scratch and build it up to a certain point, it, people would pay a fair bit of money for it. And uh, so I, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, and I sold it to have the opportunity to be able to do whatever I wanted, which started on November 1st, 2016. And uh, it's, been a, it's been an interesting journey uh, being financially uh, set up now in life. But you still have great desire to do a lot. So now what I'm doing is I moved on with the factory is trying to help other entrepreneurs be able to control their destiny and be able to build their business. And uh, I felt when I was in Dynamic Connections, I had complete control of my business because I had this very much definitive plan that I started with the very beginning that I was executing along the way. And so now I've just taken that same sort of planning and technology ideas and, and an understanding of maybe I would describe it the base, basic business principles. And now I help people at the factory to do it. And that was an exciting transition that I was already doing as I was in the process of selling Dynamic Connections. So I realized I could transition to my new world. And that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, and we're going to talk all about that. And before we let let this go, just so we can understand a little bit more, yeah. what type of, were you guys doing um, LTL freight? What type of uh, logistics were as Dynamic Connections doing for customers? You bet. Yeah, after all my experience, I touched all parts, everything from ocean freight to the courier to LTL to truckload uh, in my career. Uh, as, as my two companies primarily worked on LTL and truckload, we didn't work as much with the ocean freight because we felt it was quite saturated. Uh, but we're very successful, uh, both on the LPL and truckload. And, you know, this, it, it's such a challenging uh, business logistics. And the business that you're in or the business that other people are in, there's just so many variables that are involved in logistics. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things I'd say, because I, 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 one, of the, one of the greatest things I'm able to do is help advise other companies how to choose their logistics. And it's funny how we choose it. Many people just choose it based on price. And I tried to help educate it that really you want to choose it. Not The price of your transportation should be a very marginal part of your overall cost of goods sold. Yet the price of an experience, customer, a negative customer experience, or for that matter, a negative experience can be so costly. We must understand what our options are. And I think most transportation decisions should be based on the amount of communication they're going to receive and the understanding of the process of which the logistics company works. And I found I was able to do it most effectively with an LTL and a truckload format as opposed to the uh, over the seas or for that matter, courier. So we grew exponentially with a lot of, I would describe it, information transfer that helped our customers be able to take care of their customers more effectively as we were not only a conduit for the freight, but also for information to the customer, which reduced uh, conflict and increased our relationships. Well, I mean, it sounded like, that sounded like a yeah. lot there. I, well, know, I just looked at myself there. <laughs> no, you hit a good point. Let me explain how we did that. Let me, yeah, let me hit, let me explain. Let me explain that. that. That sounded like, like almost like a mystery, but I'll explain. Our philosophy was that if you're selling an appliance to a customer that you check for this, how much it costs, and then you would send the information within your system. You decide to go with the company X, Y, and they're going to make a delivery to customer A. And if the course, if it delivers perfectly, customer is, of course, happy and pays what he's supposed to pay. If anything goes wrong, the customer negatively thinks about, A, most likely the trucking company, but most importantly, your company. And we always felt that was an issue, that you didn't make a decision to make a mistake. You made a decision that we would meet our criteria and do it. So how we did it is we used technology. As soon as a shipment was originated, we sent information directly to the consumer, letting them know it was company and how we were acting as a partner immediately taking responsibility that we had taken the shipment over. Then proceeded to provide them information or updates directly to them, as well as to the consumer, as well as at the final destination delivery. We also sent through a little survey that they did, either a yellow, green, or red happy face. With this, we were able to build our customer's database that we were able to tell them there was a problem at a delivery within seconds of there being a problem, and people were attacking the problem, as opposed to the 98% that went well, 
they knew about them too. But the ones that had a problem, we were able to put everybody's attention on it as quickly as possible. And I think that's what people need to think about with logistics. How do they identify a problem? How do they fix it? Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've been dealing with it for almost 20 years, so you're spot on. And uh, obviously, you know, I only see it from the outside. So yeah, we're tempted to make our decisions based on price, but I can tell you, you know, shout out to Ocean Freight. Um, mm-hmm. you, well, there's a couple different Ocean Freight companies that are doing it right now, but you know, the data that you can now get that you couldn't get before right. with a lot of these Ocean Freight companies makes life completely different. Like you're choosing a company because you can see where every container is. Yeah, Deliveries can be planned out in advance way more. And then even all the drayage and in, in the local side, you know, if you take them that far to your warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's so many costs involved that you can cut out. And also you got to staff up sometimes if there's a lot of containers coming on one day versus another day and just being able to see that and have that visibility ahead of time and also just integrating 100%. your ERP. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking my language. I totally understand um, what you're talking about. And when I was doing this too, as well, Luke, the technology wasn't as much. So we were actually having to do physical labor to go call the trucking companies to get the information, then put it into a program that allowed us to give all the information directly to the customer. Uh, and that allowed us to, to almost jump ahead to the Uber we're at today, where we, it would be posted on a map. We were, we were faking the technology existing to the carrier by using the phone or, or discover rudimentary work. In the end, what we ended up doing was building that as technology improved along the way. We built that into the technology and, and, and got right into their systems. So I think as it, where, it go, where it's going in the future will be and should be complete visibility. And the way it should work in the future um, would be very much like Uber operates with your car coming. Where is my stuff? You should own where your location of your stuff is at all times. Yeah. And yet that's, that's, that's and I don't mean own it like, like you have to look at it. But if there's a problem, it identifies it to you. That's the way our system worked. So if you received an email from us and it was covered in red, you knew you had to respond to this one. Other than that, they were buried in just a, a regular text. But you knew this one arrived with a red alert. Luke, please call us. We have an issue. And you knew right away what the problem was. Uh, you're, you're a smart man because, I mean, you built in technology into a really non, I mean, well, at least from the outside, you know, a lot of these shipping and logistics companies are not known to be technology companies. And you know, you probably helped yourself on your valuation, I'm sure. So it did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, what a great story. Why don't we, you know, ju- so right now you're helping out other business owners um, with factory and we'll have yeah. um, w- with a K and we'll have the spelling of that in the show notes um, for everybody who's listening. Yeah. But you know, the theme of this is how to start, grow and sell your business. So why don't, why don't we start with this question, which is starting a business from scratch. You know, what are three or four key things that one needs to do when they're getting started? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I wrote it. I wrote uh, that question. I thought I'd break it down into three things plan, the team, and the financials. And within that, there's, of course, subsets. But it's as simple as when you start out with your idea, what is your idea? And within that idea, what is your sell of what you're going to sell to the customer? Please explain it to me. Who are your customers and how plentiful are there? How are you going to attach yourself to them? What are the financials you're going to need for not only startup, but how are you going to hit these growth expectations? And the final thing is, where do you fit into the future? Because if this is a short-term thing selling, for example, at this point in time, PPE to everybody on the planet, which may or may not be a big seller five years from now, for example, then I don't want to, th- that's not a good idea. But the idea in many cases can be built around the following, a plan that c- concludes how your product is going to fit into the marketplace, how your people are going to fit into your plan, and how your performance is going to be measured from everything from the activities to the results. And if you think about that from a logical standpoint, um, it seems relatively simple. And within that, the people are, they're either going to be building the business or taking care of the business. And which ones are the most valuable and how are you going to get them and where are you going to get them from? These are things that I think about. And I, every time I coach a person, you know, we try to find the person they want to hire in the future today so we can find out how we can get to the point where that person wants to join the company. Well, I think you should think about that before you even start the situation. And the final part is the financial. And really, it's an understanding of your basic costs should be understood at all time in relationship to your profits. So everything should be related to if I make this much, if I sell this much, I make this much. Not how much I sell, but how much do I make? Now, that doesn't always apply. In some cases, we talk about the technology sector right now where they just need customers and revenue. That's a different marketplace. I don't, I don't know if the, the same things apply. But in most cases, like yourself, you need to know what your costs are to get started to be able to 
bring on the right amount of inventory, to put out the right amount of marketing, to get the right amount of people to touch the right amount of customers, which will generate a certain amount of revenues and therefore you get profits. So I always think about it. What is your plan within that? How are you going to build that team for the future? And the financials. And, and I break them into other subcategories. So it seems when I talk to most business owners, they're quite often talking about the problem they're facing today. And they don't realize they need to fix um, and work on this almost like they would their, their child's future. And uh, nothing in their child's future is left to happen. But rather, everything is planned out. And the same should be done for a business. Well, I like that quote. And uh, you, you really look out into the future and you're absolutely right. A lot of entrepreneurs are just thinking about, 100%. although that does, although that does go back to your philosophy of, of carpe diem, but we'll talk about that later. But, uh, but no, yep. I can tell you're very methodical or do you have any standards? So like if you're coaching, you know, the next question I was, I was going to ask, you know, t- tell me about how you got your company started off the ground, but we already went through that. So maybe we can talk about yeah. a client company that you've worked with, but when, when companies, I mean, Profit margins range so much from industry to industry. Are you coaching clients that they have right. to hit a minimum margin or like, how does that look um, as far as coaching clients on profit margins and things that can hit that? Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because you're absolutely right. Depending on the type of situation uh, it can change, but that's, it really comes down to for doing, if you're running a business, if you're an entrepreneur running a business and that's generally who I deal with here at the factory, let me just back it up a little bit. To have you understand here at the factory, um, I treat it like, uh, I'm like, uh, for you guys, it's like a shark tank. You know, we have a coach show up here called Dragon's Den. And it's the idea of an entrepreneur coming into your business and helping you. And we all know as entrepreneurs that sometimes this is, it's, sometimes it's bright white and everything's great. And sometimes it's cloudy and overcast. And we just cannot find our way. And then we talk, to, and we talk to most people. They don't know what we're going through or they don't really, you know, you got enough. What do you want more for? It's like, that's, I'm in the process. Or they don't realize your problems. And so to be able to talk to a fellow entrepreneur that's been through that and understands it. And that's what the factory is all about. And, and the, the, you mentioned the name. So we changed the C to a K because it was all about knowledge. So the more knowledge we could get out of you or give to you, it helped the person become more successful. And we changed the Y to an I because we believe that every single person is their own factory. And they make their own stuff. And some of the things people make the best stuff in the world. And if you improve the way you work as a, as a machine, as a, as a unit, as a producer, you become more successful, you feel better. If you fail and you feel bad, especially as an entrepreneur, it's extremely painful for us. We're very unique characters. Um, and uh, so as such, we try to make sure that I try to help them to understand what their maximum gain can be. And that can be in the form of, we need to get more revenue to buy a better machine that'll help us become more successful. Or in the case of software, we need to improve because we need to hit a threshold of 10,000 customers. Then we start making profit. So I'm actually open to the concept that it's really all the same situation. How do we improve our plan and goal setting? How do we improve our team and break down the financials, not just on the profits, but what activities need to be taken? What resources do we need to have available? And how fast can we do this? Most important, that's where I spend a lot of my time is how fast. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about scaling. Obviously, that, that's part of it, you know, how to start and then the next part grow and then sell your business. So on the growth part, Maybe you can give an example of common themes you see about scaling companies that you work with. That, that'd be fun to hear, either themes or, a, or an individual story. Cool. Well, the things I look for right away, the things I ask questions about, and I think everybody should ask these questions. How do we do our business development? How do we do our business development? And how good are we at it? And I always ask people to measure between one and seven. You know, how's your sales force? One to seven. Who's your best sales guy? One to seven. Who's your worst? Why haven't you fired him? You know? And they go through this whole exercise where I'm basically firing these questions of these poor owners and they're starting to feel bad that they've been, as you mentioned, dealing with today and not dealing with what's happened yesterday and the future. It's going to happen. So once you understand their business development, that's an interesting thing that I put all my energies into because I realized that sales growth in business solves most problems. You can hire better people if you have more money. From then we look at, I ask people to look at their process. How do you do something? How fast is uh, something that's going wrong brought to your attention? How, how, how much is it noticeable that something went wrong? Or is there no process and people just do their own thing? Or I always try to find out if an owner is working in the business or working on the business. And so the ones that are working in the business, generally the process is flawed. The ones that are working on the business, the process is strong. And the final thing is uh, we diagnose, uh, we look for one or two people we can develop. That's it. I fear there's usually a ratio. If I can find one or two people in the organization 
uh, out of 10, 15, I think we can do something with them, build around them. And so those are the things we look for quick. And then the longer term is just improving to overall where I try to bring in technology and really make it so the managers of the business, whether it be the owner or the manager, manages the process. And then we just continue to, re- I would describe it, uh, uh, recalibrate it as things happen. So it's, it's like initially a, a puncture and then we look to sort of just massage it from then. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you start right. in biz dev, you look at the process and then you look to develop people. Tell me about the, what are the typical roles? Um, you know, again, it's just fun to hear if you've worked with you know, a bunch of companies and it's, sure. is it always a sales uh, role that you're trying to develop? Does it vary? It, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, what roles you end up spending more time on. Yeah. I, I generally would stay in, in the, in the business development customer experience roles. Uh, and including, I might add, because of my experience, I do work with a fair bit of logistics companies as well, is having them understand how to sell their freight to a carrier. Uh, so that's a funny that I'm even, ter- most for me, for me, to, to, uh, to be fair, almost all language comes back to sales. That's how I look at it. I believe everybody's selling all the time, just some people are better at it. Okay. Um, and so the idea being is that I, I, I don't generally deal with the administrative or financial people. Uh, for obvious reasons, I'm not, it's, on a, it's on a strength of mine. Um, and I, I generally deal with, I would describe it, management, owners, sales, customer experience, and I touch logistics just for my, for my thing. But if it would be a, um, I would describe it, somebody looking to improve lean performance in their factory or to maybe improve their warehousing, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert. And so I'm very careful to stay in an area. But what I do do whenever I train companies is I try to get every single person to realize that if you have a message to provide, provide that message captured within a clear, clear, concise communication that allows us to understand that it's both competent, competent, and has has us clearly understanding what you need us to do so we can move forward faster. That's a large part of what um, I think is lost. They, people forget they have to, they don't get to tell somebody what to do. They have to tell them what to do and the why they need to do it. And I feel especially as an order, that's something they don't often do as well. That's such a great point. And I've learned that over the last couple of years, you got to give them the why, because otherwise they have no context. They need it. Yeah. It's hard for them. And they're trying to, I always say to owners that are mad about their employees. And I'd say, okay, do you really feel that guy's out to get you? Is that what you're thinking? Cause like, that's the case. Let's go get him. That sounds terrible. Or do you maybe think he can't figure out what you want, which is probably more likely. Um, that you, you're not clear on what you want, but you, I just asked you to lay it out for me. You can't lay it out. So that guy's going to obviously fail. And I think that's what I think is most important. Whereas if you give them the what and the why, then you know what you want and you know how you want it done. You know what the result is and it's easier for everybody to be successful. And if it's a repetitive action, you should be able to do that. If everybody wants a new, a new situation, then you'd want to train them how to develop their own understanding of the why. Yeah. But the why is necessary. It's such a good point. And we've done a lot of employee surveys and, you know, we got best places to work for last year. And in these surveys, right. you learn, you know, in, because the employees, they'll come back and they say, we don't know what's going on, or we need better communication, or we want to understand, Correct. you know, what the company goals are. And that's where, you know, really explaining the why on everything I've learned, um, you know, because there's all these things about, you know, improving culture. And I mean, the free food is, is honestly not as important as people having friends at work and people knowing the communication and mission and direction of the company. Like those are the things that I found, um, I think are going to, you know, create more, uh, you know, understanding and a better culture and, um, you know, communication and, and knowing the why is key. So it's, it's a great point you bring up. You know, it's funny whenever I design my companies from the factory, I explained the F, the K and so the I or dynamic connections. That was, it was funny. I, not only do I design the name of the company, to make it successful. But I also designed the business card and the way in which the, the name, I could do the whole sell every single time from just the name or the business card. I could sell my company where the person would buy it. And I think that's what I think people need to understand that they need, they need to, they need, they probably know it that deep as an entrepreneur. And I'm sure you do as well, right? You feel it. Mm-hmm. Well, you got to give that same feeling to them. Yep. <laughs> or else they just can't be as successful for you. But yeah, it's interesting when we get, when you, when you do do that for them, then you, I'm sure you have somebody in your office that it's just, you know, bleeds your colors, right? Or then maybe a lot, yeah. but they bleed your colors. Like they're, they're irreplaceable. Love them. It makes life a lot easier too. You, you, you know, I wish I, I wish I learned a lot of these things quicker, but you know, for business, it just makes life a lot easier when um, you are able to step outside because then you have the team, you know, 
doing things that maybe you were doing in the past. And it's, it's a function of that communication and, and that trust. Yeah. So, well, I always looked at it like this. I always looked at how I, if, if, if you're the owner of the company, which is therefore you are responsible for the vision, direction, the planning, the execution, really for all intents and purposes, all, all of those things. How are you doing? <laughs> how are you also doing at the same time? Yeah. Cause really should you be, if you can't, if it's not scalable to other people, or to other circumstances, and you're doing it, then I believe in many ways you're you're limiting your capacity. And and if if you're even if you're not limiting your capacity, then you are 100% limiting your employees' capacity. Whereas if you allow them to be successful or fail and help them along the way, we have growth. We have we have exponential growth. That's so true. And then and you talked about on scaling. You you mentioned technology a couple times. Why don't we dive into that? Maybe an example or or sure. How are you adding technology? Um, I mean, just as an example, with a lot of companies, you know, software is a difficult process and usually it's going to help out in operations. Um, it's going to obviously yeah. improve efficiency. Is there a specific type of software? Um, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I, again, yeah. yeah why, don't I, why don't I even just go through a few of them that I find very helpful? Sure. I mean, these are the one things I coach people on and, and, and you have plugs for the companies or are they really plugs to help the owners? I say the plugs to help the owners yep. and I'm here to help the owners. Like the entrepreneur, I believe, I believe the corporate world is one thing and the entrepreneur world is another thing. And the tools that we use in this world how, can really help us to give us that freedom and flexibility. So for example, and most of mine will be built around mostly sales process, but customer experience, what I would say. So there may, but there would be a therefore. For example, Salesforce is the foundation of every one of my businesses. Mm. Every one of my businesses has been built on Salesforce. I am a firm believer that is the absolute best product out there. The way they lay everything in, it's kind of like the app store on Apple as far as I'm concerned. I've dealt with other things. I've managed other situations. but I, And I, I, I've participated now in hundreds of different companies that have many different products out there. But I love Salesforce. Three, three cheers for them and what they're doing. But to company, a company that, to using tools like a tool called Calendly, which lets you set appointments with people that allow you to, to give, the, give the impression that you care about the person and let them do that. Or another product called Vidyard, which is phenomenal for sales, which allows you to send a, a video uh, email. So you send an email and a video and you can see where they watched it, what they thought about it, or you can allow them to book an appointment, all kinds of different things. Or the likes of uh, uh, Slack or, or Hunter that helps you find people's emails on, uh, on Google, where you can go find people's emails you want to contact. It's just so hard to get a hold of people. Or for that matter, I think, of course, one of the best tools out there is LinkedIn. And I, I'm a firm believer, and I try and coach people I coach, to spend, to join the groups and their thing, and to be on that LinkedIn to find out what products are coming out within your industry. And uh, I'm working with a, a construction company right now. Uh, they, they service the construction industry, and I'm working with them to try and improve their processes. And not, not an area of strength, but I'm working with them, but the owner is very strong. And the way we've been able to find the technology and what he's found, and just how I've looked at it, because I looked at it from what I wanted to have happen for him. And it has been remarkable. So I think it's industry specific. I, for you, it might be warehousing, controlling your logistics. For this person over here, it could be how their people uh, talk to a customer service experience and ca catalog the information. But I think technology, you should be pressing. I'll give you two examples. One is an example of my last company, Dynamic Connections where we had, remember I talked about how the people had to call all the carriers every morning to get the information. Yep. And it would require about 25 people to call from eight, from eight o'clock morning till 1130. It was the most stressful thing in the company. We received misinformation. We received the wrong information. We provided, you know, it just was a catalog of errors it made. And it wasn't almost my people's fault. It's just, it was a telephone game, I guess you'd say. But I, I do feel that it was just, it was poor experience for the customer until we finally put it into a, a, a website-based application where the carriers put it in there and we rewarded them by putting the information in there with more freight and paying their bills faster. And so therefore they went there faster and gave us the information and they updated it perfectly exactly where the person was right when we wanted it because we put it, made it easy for them through technology. And that information would transfer right back to our database and be available to our customer within an instant. And they would then be able to get, receive an update. So it was the idea before we used to push the information. Now we we allowed two, the two parties to come together in the same place and they deposited the information. It was easier for them. Another situation uh, is related to a, how a customer is managing a sales team. And before he didn't like them, now he finds out that the guy he didn't like the most is working the hardest for him. Those are things that you have to be able to measure. And so it's just tools that I find that, that when I, sorry, I didn't finish on that thing. So of the 25 people that had to do this for 
five hours. By the third day, we were down to two people having to make calls within about an hour and a half. That's oh, it. Wow. Everything else came That's in through technology. It was remarkable. I'd never seen anything like that happen before. That's actually what sold our business. Just that technology. That was, yeah. that was the key that, they, that everybody realized that this is worth more money. Look at he's got here. That's why I say technology. Look for yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, and, and those are good, you know, uh, you got Salesforce and Cal- Calendly and Vidyard, Slack, Hunter, LinkedIn, you know, about, I think you, I think you pronounce it Vidyard. We're looking at a similar um, video product. It's so it's, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because it's great. You can, you know, record uh, whether it's a pitch or maybe show a new product yep. and you can, you know, yep. send that out to your buyer or potentially, you know, a potential new customer or a lead um, in our business, you yep. know, it, it's more that you're dealing, you're building relationships with buyers. So uh, in this world, yep. you know, we can't fly over there as easily or at all right now. It, it's, it's huge. These are, it's a great idea. Yeah. I, 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 I it's funny uh, Vidyard is actually a, a product we started to use. Um, and then uh, I actually trained their sales team as a matter of fact. And, um, and it is like a remark, it's a remarkable product. Like I, they, we, I'm a huge fan of that product. Whether you buy that product or another one, Definitely get this in your arsenal. Every company needs this. It allows you the opportunity. It's like Zoom, but you know what? It's you know what I, you know what Zoom is. I think Zoom is awkward, and I love Zoom. We need it. But you, before in a meeting, you could doze off for a second. You know, you could you could zone out. You can't do it in Zoom, no. right? <laughs> and with an e, you can't. They're watching your face. It's you draining. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's harder. It's harder. Zoom's harder than a regular meeting. But what I love about the Vidyard, that email that everybody else sent, and then all of a sudden. Here is Luke Peters with his beautiful smile and face. And if you do it correctly, you'll get that customer's attention. And you can, in a minute and 10 seconds, get across an email that will allow the person to understand the value in which, why you wish to speak to them. And so I'd highly recommend for everybody out there to invest a video, invest in a Vidyard or something similar. And I know with Vidyard, they even have a free product you can try for free. So uh, you can test it on, on you, you can do it for free. It has some limited capabilities in the regular product, but even the regular product, regular product is inexpensive in comparison to value. The return on investment is immediate. So yeah. yes, for your leak, Luke, you buy that product. Awesome. That'll change your business. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the sale of your business. Um, again, you know, got yeah. a lot of business owners listening, like, you know, I got, I got so many questions about it, but like, how did you manage the sale of your business? Did you get a banker? It sounds like initially when you talked about it, you, you even had a plan and you knew who the buyers might be. Uh, did you go right to yep. who, who you thought was a synergistic buyer? It'd be great to hear some details about that. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. In fact, I have a, I have a very definitive plan. If you don't mind, I'll just explain it a little bit. Sure. Um, because I think this is an awesome experience. I think the opportunity to sell your business is a remarkable uh, situation. And of course, there's factors. There's the multiplier, okay, uh, which is really usually created to something, either the EBITDA or revenue or whatever the case may be. And you want that multiplier to be as large as possible. And the multiplier is usually as large as possible based on the fact that what your product is and how that product is received in the marketplace. If it's extremely unique or it's extremely valuable to the marketplace or the world, yes, of course, the multipliers go crazy. But in most cases, most businesses don't, don't have that opportunity to have that 50 multiplier. It's not going to be possible. They got to work with the more realistic three to five, five to 10, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? Um, and now it becomes maximizing that. And the only way to do it is a full plan. You have to build it around the following things again. What have you done? And what is your plan going forward? The future we talked about. You already know that. Just I mean, the people bought my business. They knew what they're going to get. They knew what the future would hold because we've already build, been building the past that was building the future. Second thing was the uh, team. You didn't have they didn't you didn't have to love everybody, but you needed to love some people that they were going to love too. That was number. That was the, probably the most critical thing. They needed to trust somebody. You need to. They needed to be really somebody that was just remarkable, just like somebody in your organization. I'm sure you would say that as. Yep. And the final bit of it is there can be no mistakes in the financials. There can be, there can be nothing. So for example, our financials, it was funny. Um, and I'll get to who I sold it to in a second. But when I went to sell my business, before I started Dynamic Connections, I wrote in the same book that I used to start the Dynamic Connections, I still have the book. I wrote down what I was going to sell the business for. And I anticipated it would take me 12 years to get to that point. And I knew how much revenue I would need and how much profit I would need. And I knew I would sell it for a certain multiplier. I didn't know at the time it was going to be sold based on technology. But I, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to do this the rest of my life. I wanted to do something different. But this was a way to get that much money 
that quick. And um, I set about it uh, with that goal in mind. And it was always talking about it. Even my employees knew I was going to sell the business because I'd already sold one. So it was interesting. Most most owners keep that secret. I I, I would go to conferences and with my bring in my. I'd always bring. There's a key thing. I'd always bring a couple of my key guys with me so they could be so we could be seen as a team. And it was those key guys that they bought the business off of. That's mm. who they bought because the key guys were always around. Yep. Um, they were always known. They were known commodities. Not just I'm the owner and the rest of these people just work for me. It was like, yeah, this is my team, you know. And I was always trying to make it so that. We're just equals. I never saw myself as the boss. I saw them as the boss and me in charge of them. Um, and so those, those the, remember the, the, the people by the financials, there could be no mistakes. The people, they need a couple of them that they can trust and rely upon. They'll want their own anyways. And then it becomes the plan. And so what you do, and I'm recommending for everybody out there, you should have a PowerPoint built up today or tomorrow that says the following. This is our UVP or why we were started or why we exist. This is our, what we have done in the past, one or two slides. This is why our team is strong. This is the financials in one slide. And the last slide is how much money you want based on, a, based on the multiplier that you list out right in front of them. And that's how I sold my business with nine slides. I sent it over to a person. Who, people kept asking, we're interested in my business. I would say, no problem. I have a PowerPoint. I'll send it to you. And I'd send over this PowerPoint. And, of course, they were always like, well, we got to get into this deeper. Nope. We negotiate from that point right there. And for some people, they were gone right away. They didn't want to participate, which is a lot of the problem with people. They get excited as tire kickers come by and they get them excited. And then they realize there was nothing there anyways. And then they can't really sell it because it wasn't really a sellable business. They got caught up in something. So at least with this way, you control it and you get them. You have a strong idea before you can get there of what they're going to do. And that's probably the thing that I, A, help people with and B, was number one the most successful part of my selling to my, my business second time. Oh man, good for you. That That's awesome. And yet you put yourself yeah. in that position where it was in demand. You know, it wasn't, uh, you, it sounds like you're able to send that to several people and then, uh, you know, one of them understood it and, and that's what happened. Well, they'll come out. Once you put yourself out there that you're willing to be sold in a communicative effort in the right places, it's a little bit tougher now because it's not trade shows and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. That's where I used to do it, trade shows. I would make it known, Okay. But you want, if, if you use, I've had people use a business broker with different levels of varying success. Okay, I've had uh, some people use lawyers with different levels of success. Accountants are usually fairly good to help them sell their business because I find the accountants approach it much more pragmatically. Um, the business brokers kind of want to get paid, kind of like for their efforts, not really understanding the owner. It's very emotional for the owner. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's all about you. People think they want to sell their business. And I would hazard to most people, you'd be careful what you wish for. And why is that? Because you're going to have to do something. Um, because we're, again, if it's an entrepreneurial person, uh, even one that might be multi-generational, you are definitely of a different breed. I don't mean that to mean that the other people aren't as good or different. I just mean that we are usually willing to fight through a lot more adversity than other people are. We are usually very active. And whether we're type A, B, C, D, or whatever, we are very omnipresent in most situations related to our business. 24 hours a day for us in most cases. We think about it or be aware of it. And then all of a sudden you take that away. You're, you're, you, while you may have money, you don't have a, you don't have a lot of, you have a lot to do. Yeah. You're, 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 you lose a lot of your identity. You lose a lot of your, your perspective. And for a lot of business owners, um, they struggle with that. It, it's, you know, it's funny. I was listening to Barack Obama's book and he talked about act two. And that would be a perfect example, not to diminish the presence of the United States, but the idea of once he was finished, he kind of reached the pinnacle, right? If you build a business, you're able to sell it, get lots of money. You've kind of climbed the mountain, right? You've done way better than everybody else has. Now, what do you do? Yeah. And what did you do? How, how, how were your next six months? Did you kind of fall into that quiet, you know, that space where you're like, whoa, I need to fill this void? No, I built myself a, a super cool office, first and foremost. So I have like a back cave um, uh, that, I, that I work out of. So I get, you know, like the real nice place that I get to work out. I knew I wanted to be a businessman. I'll probably, I'll probably own about four or five more business. I'm currently advising on a half a dozen right now that I, I may invest in. And so it's the idea that I knew I was going to be going back in it, which is exactly why I created the factory. In most cases, what I'd recommend, I'm only 55, so I feel like I'm a bit young. If you're 70, of course, you can stop. But if you're, if you're able to sell when you're younger, 
then money doesn't buy you happiness. Is which that's a that's an absolute cliche. You, who you are is who you're who you are as a being. What you know, what you are, what you do, what you do is what you are, not what you have. That's a great way to say it. Well, why don't we? Yeah, yeah I'd love to finish hearing a little bit more of your philosophy. Uh, Carpe diem is the philosophy yeah. you live by. Um, you know, that'd be fun to kind of hear from you explain uh, why and how that's improved your life. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you know one of the things that, that has always been important to me um, is uh, is just having fun. I just I, carpe diem is seized the day. It's in all my license plates. It's it's all over my office. It's in my lifestyle. Uh, if I don't have tattoos, but if I had a tattoo, it would be right across <laughs> my back and front, probably. That's funny. And it's the idea. Every time I walk up to my cars, I I I, I look at the carpe diem. I have, you know, and I say to myself, okay, here we go. And it's yeah, like, well, if not, why not? You know, I talked about my, my, my former business partner daughter and she, you know, she had a terrible disease she had. I mean, she would kill to have this day if I'm not going to use it, you know, or, or, or this guy over here that's, that's kids got cancer is in the hospital. He would kill for his kid to have this day if I'm not going to use it. That's kind of weird, but that's kind of how I look at it. But I better get the most out of today and do the most I can for others in most cases. I really believe that the most I can for others allows me to feel more successful. Especially me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm I've got a lot. I've got, I've, I've, I've managed to be okay. So I'd like to take care of others. And, um, and so carpe diem is just like makes some sense. And, and the idea of the, you know, why is my, you know, how did I become successful? And did I, did I have to give up my kids? I'm like, no. I just, you know, I saw the, I saw the world as 24 seven, 365, and I just, I just fit it in. So I never missed an event with my kids, but I might have to go back to the office from nine to midnight. Or I may have to, you know, work on Saturday or whatever. But I, I, I always figured out a way to stay omnipresent in the situation. And always, one of the key things for me as an entrepreneur is I was always attached to my business via my cell phone. So I was willing to take a call 24 hours a day, but I didn't feel I had to be present to be omnipresent. So therefore, Carpe Diem just allowed me to basically, I've, I've, been, I've been having a blast. I get to live a good life. I'm the lucky one. It comes through in your emotions and your voice and, and really, you know, such an inspirational way to end this, but I don't know if, if you're okay with it, Chris, you do have another really cool story. Um, are you able to tell that story yeah. about, uh, yeah, Good. Rebecca, Rebecca. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think yep. the audience would love to hear that story. Yeah. You know, and I think this is, this is, this is it. I think this is what business is all about is, is using, using whatever strengths you have. And, and I say business, that's what this is all about business. But of course, it's our personal and professional lives where they're intermingled. So as I mentioned, Doug, my former uh, business partner from a few businesses ago, his daughter, Rebecca, was born with a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is like a Lou Gehrig's disease for, for children. And it's a terminal disease. And at the time, it was very terminal. And there were three types. And it was horrible. You know, and, and when this was diagnosed with Doug's daughter, of course, we decided you know, he, they were going to do everything they could. He needed all the help he could get. We were going to support him. But then there was a there was a run that was decided by his sister. She came up with an idea for a five k run, uh, and and we we I, I was asked to be an MC and help out. We tried hard. We worked hard at this run, and then they, there was also a dinner. And there's you know we we became close with this whole society because it was a bunch of volunteer parents that were just fighting like crazy for their kids, harder than an entrepreneur would ever fight for a woman and man to fight for their sick child. It's, there's nothing like it. They're ferocious. They're they're wonderful. They're you know, they do anything they can for that child and the child's fighting as well. And so over time, we, we kept raising money and doing everything we could, getting sponsors. And there's the, there was an American association, a Canadian association. They were working so hard. And in the end, there was a one, we donated the money. And uh, this is back when stem cell research was becoming somewhat popular. And I believe the gentleman was in Maryland, actually, a uh, university in Maryland. And they've now come up with a cure. So had we not pressed so hard to get every dollar and dime we could from every single event and donate it and volunteer and do everything we could to get silent auction items or, or live auction items or, or ask for donations from the local grocery store. We never would have made it, maybe. We don't know which dollar was critical. But now, because of that, there's a drug called Spinraza that a child that has SMA can take and lead a relatively normal life. And it could literally change the course of history. And so while I appreciate I want you to be successful in business, if you're an entrepreneur out there, Salesforce is a good example. They do it. I've always done it. A portion of your proceeds should go towards charity, but a portion of your energy should go towards charity as well, because we're the ones who can help some of these charities 
to help some of these people that need our help become more successful. From this point forward, I created the Make a Difference Movement, which is the idea that how much you can make a difference for somebody is really important. But most importantly, let somebody else know how they made a difference for you. And you'll recognize how much that'll make a difference for you and for them and for other people as they pay it forward. So from that, what those one little act has changed so many things. And to be honest with you, I, I, I attribute that being that MC at that run is probably one of the accomplishments in my life that we helped to participate in, in changing the course of history for, by helping come up with that drug. I'm so pleased. And that for cancer and for everything else, I recommend we continue to do the same to try and change the course of history on all of these problems by helping these people that need their help and supporting them. That's my story. Oh, it's, it's such an awesome story. And, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And uh, it's a great way to, to finish the podcast. Everybody, yeah. everybody here has to stay involved. And, and thanks, my friend, Chris, for, for hopping on. Um, how can listeners f- uh, find you, learn more about you? Maybe they can go over to Factory. We'll have that in the show notes. Uh, and yet, yeah. I know you're active on LinkedIn as well. Um, are those the two primary areas? Yeah, I would think LinkedIn's probably the best. I put out videos every every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're either motivation or or tips for business people. Great for your salespeople to watch. Great for your team to watch. Generally, it's all really positive. And I just like to say, you know, I'm I, I'm so blessed to be in the spot I'm in helping entrepreneurs. And for all of you that are out there, maybe feeling a bit of stress right now with COVID, maybe feeling overwhelmed, maybe up against it. You know, I, I'd certainly support anybody that needs your help, but I want you to know you have it in you. You got it. So you can reach out to me at the factory or LinkedIn. You can probably put those links in, in the podcast, but I, I, I'd be here for anybody if they needed any assistance and as a coach or a mentor or even just even answer a question. That's just the way I operate. Well, thanks for that, Chris. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of the Page One Podcast sponsored by Retail Band. Uh, hope you enjoyed the interview today. Really, really appreciate your reviews. If you can hop on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And we're looking forward to you guys joining us on the next interview. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Page One Podcast with Luke Peters. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us out by leaving us a rating on iTunes. Want to double your online sales? Check out www.retailband.com. And don't forget to join us next week with our next amazing guest.